be seated. <laughs> Everybody's nervous from last Sunday. <laughs> Whew. So glad to be in the house of the Lord this morning. Amen. If you're listening by internet, Facebook, thank you for being with us. Uh, possibly Brother Marty is listening, so uh, Brother Marty, we love you. We're looking forward to you being back. Uh, Brother Marty also wants all the men in this room to know Happy Father's Day from him all the way from Africa. We're going to start out this morning. I want to honor our fathers. And I want to say there's some things that fathers need to pass on to their sons. And I know if you've got daughters then you're going to say, well, this isn't for me. Well, you find a son somewhere and you pass this on. Be godly, be faithful, don't fit into this world. Never shake a man's hand sitting down. Don't enter a pool by the stairs. The man at the barbecue grill is the closest thing to a king. In a negotiation, never make the first offer. Always request late checkout. Hallelujah. Amen. And when you entrusted with a secret, keep it. Hold your heroes to a higher standard. Return a barred car with a full tank of gas. Amen. I'm hearing some moaning now. <laughs> play with passion or don't play at all. When shaking a hand, grip it firmly, not like a fish, and look them in the eye. Don't let a wishbone grow where a backbone should be. Stop it, Chris. If you need music at a beach, you're missing the point. You marry the girl, you marry her family. Pray, I'm praying for you, Bradley. All right. <laughs> they all look the same. I, I don't understand. No matter which one's the oldest, they, I, I get them all mixed up, just like your baby girls. Be like a duck. Remain calm on the surface. Paddle like crazy underneath. Never be afraid to ask out the best-looking girl in the room. Never turn down a breath mint. Try writing your eulogy and never stop revising. Thank a veteran and make it up to him. After writing an angry email, read it carefully and then delete it. Ask your mom to play. She won't let you win. Now we're going to go King James, and I'm going to say, Manners maketh the man. Give credit and take the blame. Stand up to bullies and protect those bullies. Write down your dreams. Be confident and humble at the same time. And if ever in doubt, remember whose son you are and refuse to be ordinary. And all the things lead by example, not by explanation. If you're a dad in this room, would you please stand? Now, I'm really not sure why people were laughing at that. Dads, fathers, I want to thank you. I want you to know that if our country's going to change, it's going to be because of us. If our country's going to be led in the right direction, it's going to be because of us. And so right now, if there's a man standing close to you and he is your dad, this is your opportunity as a teenager or as a child to lay hands on your father. You've always wanted to do this. So I'm going to ask you, pray for the person who is standing. If he's your father, that means start moving. Pray for that fella. Put your hands on him. Gather him up. 
hug his neck. If there's a man that doesn't have someone praying for them, go find one. Somebody, you, you find him, and you pray for him. Come on, move. I know this is Baptist church, and y'all don't like to move after you sit down. Come on. Y'all doing better. All right, let's pray. Right now, you pray. You can pray silently or you can pray out loud. Pray. Father, our heart cries out to you at this very moment. Father, I ask you in in heaven to send somebody close to where my dad is and tell him thank you. And I know Pop is over there too, and so God, I pray you would tell him my two greatest examples of what a father was all about were those two men. Father, I ask you for my brothers in this room. Lord, that you will hold them close to you. And Father, that they won't give us their hand with money in it, but they will give us their hand. They will give us their life. And so, God, I pray. I pray, God, that if... if, If dad is far away from you, Lord, that he will come closer to you. Father, I pray that if if dad doesn't know you, that he will come to know you as Savior and Lord. So, God, I pray that you will do what only you can do. Change our dads. Help us to be the men of God you've called us to be. And we ask these things in the precious name of Jesus. If you agree with the prayer, say amen. Amen. You may be seated. The title of the message this morning is a holdout soldier. Holdout soldiers. And I believe that with all my heart is what Dads need to be, what fathers need to be, need to be holdout soldiers. When everybody else is running, the dad needs to stand in the middle of the room and take on the battle. I'm reminded of David's mighty men. One of his mighty men stood in a pea patch while everybody else ran, and he took on all the Philistines with his sword. And when the battle was over, he had, he had slewed so many men that they could not pry his sword off of his hand because of all the debris that covered him. We need men like that today. But what I want to do is I want to I bring to your attention, and as we, we've, this whole month to me is an honor to, to those who have uh, fought for our country. It wasn't long ago on June the 6th in 1944, landing crafts opened and men stepped out living and stepped out on water and stepped out on sand and never made it back home. 75th anniversary of D-Day. And we honor all all those ones who gave the ultimate sacrifice so that we can have the freedom that we have today. They not only fought for America, but they fought for all countries that wanted freedom. So when I think about a holdout soldier, I want you to look in 2 Timothy 2, 3, and 4. It says this, Join me in suffering like a good soldier of Christ Jesus. 
No one serving as a soldier gets entangled with civilian affairs, but rather tries to please his commanding officer. And when I thought about this, and, and I thought about this sermon for last week, I thought about a, an article that I, I had the opportunity to read back in 2014, and, and I found this article about a Japanese soldier that finally surrendered in 1974. His name is Hiro Anada. He walked out of the jungle on March the 11th, 1974, with his commanding officer, the young hippie who was searching for him, and officers of the Philippine Island. And World War II ended on September the 2nd, 1945. And in 1944, the, Jap the Imperial Japanese Army set Hiro out into the jungle on a secret mission. And as they put him out in the jungle, they said these powerful words. They said, listen, no matter what, you stand your ground. You stay where you're supposed to be. You do what your orders say. For almost 30 years, the second lieutenant in the Imperial Japanese Army assigned to a small island to get secret on a secret mission of intelligence. One year before the war ends, he is then sent on mission, and he carries it out for another 29 years. Many attempts to find him. Others sent messages. The Americans dropped leaflets saying the war is over, and here he is. Not only that, his own army went to find him and could not find him. That's when you know the training is really good. He believed that all these attempts were a trick by the enemy, that he would never, ever surrender. Then one day a young hippie young man came by and found him. And, and been telling him, listen, sir, the war is over. He said, no, son, the war is not over. He said, son, I can tell you the war is not over because my commanding officer has not come back for me. Anato would not leave without his commanding officer. And why? Here are the orders that he gave him on the day that he left him in the jungle with about 30 men. You are absolutely forbidden to, to die by your own hand. It may take five years, but whatever happens, we will come back for you. Until then, so long as you have one soldier, you continue to lead. If you have to live off coconuts, in that case, live off the coconuts. Under no circumstances are you to give up your life voluntarily. Others of his group surrendered to the U.S. and Philippine forces, and then others died. But when I thought about Hero, I thought about this. I want you to hear what, what, what came out of this story. He remained steadfast, living off the land, evading capture for three decades, keeping his uniform repaired and his rifle polished daily. His motto was struggle to the end. He carried out his orders with integrity and principle. What was his training? Notice everything around him. Have integrity, have sincerity, loyalty, devotion to duty, morality. Understanding this, one can withstand all hardships and ultimately turn hardships into victory. And when Anata finally went back to his homeland, he did not recognize his homeland. They had lost all of their desire to follow the imperial movement. He did not recognize. There were the, he said the teenagers were disrespectful. The country was disrespectful to the traditions. It moved him so much that when he got back to Japan, he moved to Brazil. He finally went back and he started a home where he could teach young men to have the training that he had. And it, it, it really hit me. For three decades, he stayed his post. He ran out of food. He ran out of everything that he needed. He stayed his post. He stood his ground. He said, I will stand because my commander said he will come back for me. And I thought about, Chris, how all this kind of 
comes together with, with the way we are as believers. And I thought about this. What would be said of you and me? Are we, have we been faithful for the last 30 years to our commanding officer? Our commanding Savior left us this. He said, go make disciples, baptize, and teach. Go make disciples, baptize, and teach. The very last thing that our Savior said we ought to do. Amen? The very last thing that he said we ought to do. And if we're doing that, we're, we're following our commanding Savior, Jesus Christ. But I believe with all my heart today that some of us are still in training camp. Some of us have been in training camp for 30, 40 years. Some of us have been in training camp for 10 years, and we, we like training camp. Everything is safe in training camp. We've got our Bible, we've got our prayer, we've got our worship, and that's, that's the weapons of our warfare, and that's the way it should be. But at some point, our training's got to take us from this room and from the study room out to the world because that's what happened with this soldier. He didn't stay in Japan. He went on mission. That's what happened with our folks now in Africa. They didn't stay here. They went on mission. That's what's happening with many of the people in this room, that you will not stay on mission just in this room. You stay on mission outside of this room. I can look around this room, and I can tell you about several people. I can tell you about a man who goes every, all right, once a week, because my mind's slipping. He goes once a week, and he always is there for a group of men, and he's training them, and he's teaching them, and he's there. He and another man, that's what they do. And Bob, how long have you been doing that? Twelve years. He didn't just get the training in here. He just didn't get the Bible stories in here. He just didn't get the precepts of, of the Word of God, which we all should do. But what he has done is he said, I am taking what you have given me, God, and I'm going and giving it to the world. Because I believe that's where the disconnect is because our world is where it is today. You say, Greg, you always say that. You're always negative. But I'm just telling you, if you can't see it around you, then you need to take the blinders off. Because when it comes down to it, like I said earlier, if we, the fathers in this room, would stand up just in our own home, stand up in our own home and say, no, you're not going to be a part of that. No, you're not going to do that. And have some kind of standard. If we, the men, would have some standard, then maybe our children would have those standards. Because what's going to run this country soon are our children, or our teenagers, or our young adults. And you say, man, that, that crowd that's 25 to 30, they're like that girl up there in Washington. No, they're not all like that. Thank God. I'm telling you, God always has a remnant. We leave him out of it. We always say the world's going to hell in a handbasket. I don't believe that. I believe the world can go to heaven. If I didn't believe that, we ought to shut this place down and go like E.V. Hill used to say and just go boogie-woogie because we have nothing if this is all it is. Now, we ought to love coming in this place. I have to say that because I'm, I'm getting eyeballs looking at me. I'm telling you, I love to come into the place of worship, but I don't love coming into the place of worship and watching people struggle to worship. Amen? Uh-oh. If you cannot worship in this room, I don't even know where to go with that. I honestly, I mean, I do, but I'm, gonna try to, I'm trying to refrain. But I'm just saying, if you can't worship God in this room, well, they sing those 7-Elevens. I'll be doggone. I used to love to go to 7-Eleven. They had Slurpees. <laughs> when Patsy first got pregnant with Zach, We'd be laying in bed in Chickasaw, Alabama, and she'd say, I want some ice cream. I'd go, I do too. Somebody's alarm's going off. Take your medicine. All right. <laughs> All right. And you say 7-Eleven. I got something for you. Y'all just say the same words all the time. Y'all don't get it? Yeah, we get it. We get it so much that we like to continue to sing it. You ready? Because listen to this. Around the throne of God are angels and seraphims. And they're singing the same thing. And they've been singing it since he's been sitting there. Holy, holy, holy 
is the Lord God Almighty. Come on, y'all. I ain't going to heaven then. All right, okay. <laughs> I'm going to get in trouble for that one. All right. But I'm just telling you guys with all my heart, I, where are you at? I see. Case and Kittle is the only kid that's ever answered this question correctly. I asked him several weeks ago, Cason, how many sermons do you think you've heard? And he looked at me with his arms folded like he's doing right now. He said, three billion. Cason, you're 17 years old, right? 52 weeks if you came, if you have perfect church attendance, 52 weeks. Somebody do the math on that. That's a lot of sermons. It's not three billion. But it feels like that, doesn't it, Casey? Now, you can be honest now. Come on. I've already called you out. You've got to be honest. Your dad's not going to slap you. I'm gonna, I'll, I'll take care of it, okay? <laughs> All right? Three billion. And, and, guys, I'm telling you, we have sat in church so long that it feels like we've heard three billion sermons. But here's the deal. Have you ever thought about just living one of them? Have you ever thought about just having one sermon that just says, okay, man, I got saved. I came to the Lord. Oh, I am radically saved. Oh, thank you, Jesus. And then something was preached after that, and now you're hanging your hat on it and going and living it. But many people are hanging their hat on the fact that, man, somebody's got to preach the word, and yes, somebody's going to preach the word. As long as there's a pulpit, and as long as there's God's word, someone's going to preach from this pulpit. But understand this, the greatest sermon that will ever be preached is when you and I lend a hand, lend service, lend love, reach out and see some of our friends and our family come to know Jesus Christ. That's when they're going to hear the sermon. They're in this room today. We're in this room today. We love to study. And I love to study. I love to read books. It just happened to me about five years ago. I got out of coloring books into real books. <laughs> I'm serious. Not the coloring part, but I I'm, I've started reading books. It's unreal. I'm like, I like reading books. I'm a nerd. I love to get knowledge. But some of us have so much knowledge in this room that we are absolutely no good to the people out in this world. You say, Greg, you shouldn't have said that. We like to pour it in, but we don't like to pour it out. Our orders haven't changed over 2,000 years. Go make disciples, baptize, and teach. Our commanding Savior will return one day, hopefully sooner than later. And what will he find? Will he, in fi will he find our enlisted soldiers of the army of the Lord fighting against our enemy, Satan? Understand this, Satan is not our friend. Satan is not somebody that we play with. It's not a game that we get on a board. It's none of that stuff. He is for real, and he doesn't like the fact that we come into this place. He doesn't like the fact that we read the Word. He doesn't like the fact that we worship. Can you imagine? I, it was sitting over here on, all by myself, and I was thinking, man, we're sitting here praising God. We're lifting up praise to God, and the, the enemy is running around here like he's, he's nuts. He's running into every wall because he can't stand to hear it because he wanted to have all that praise for himself. But God gets that praise, and we give him that praise, and that's why it bothers me when I struggle in this place to worship because when I give up the worship, it's making the devil run. And when I give up and I say, I don't like that song. I don't like the way it's played. I don't, who cares? What really cares is this, is that there's somebody playing it and we're worshiping our Heavenly Father. Amen? Some of you are, I'm losing you. What is the place of our battle? The world. It's marching, this world's marching to the beat of the drum of hell. It is. If you're embracing the world, you know what I'm talking about. 
Now listen to what the Scripture says in 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 5. The weapons of our warfare. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments, every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ and being ready to punish all disobedience when obedience is fulfilled. Guys, understand this. When that word carnal is said in the Scripture, it's the opposite of spiritual. So you want to know what carnal is? Opposite of spiritual. Carnal is just merely saying, as a man, I can do this. As a woman, I can do this. But we can't. We can't fight this battle. That's why there's so many people taking medicine, and that's why there's so many people in a hospital room right now in padded walls because they have tried to do it on their own. And you say, Greg, you shouldn't say those kind of things. But I'm telling you, if we would connect into the power, connect into the power of Almighty God, when he says these words, mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, if you want to see something happen in your life, you've got a stronghold in your life, or some of your family's got a stronghold in their life, start praying. Uh, and I'm going to say this, and I hope they're not watching. But um, we moved Gracie into an apartment on, on Friday in Huntsville which was a thank you, Jesus, and oh. So it, it, was one of the, it, it was somewhere in between. And what happened was we started praying over that room. We started praying over that, that apartment. We started praying over her roommate. And, and we love her roommate, and she's a sweet girl. And we started praying over all that. And we were just praying. And then we called her on Saturday, and we said, Hey, baby, has your roommate moved in yet? No, they haven't got here yet. I'm like, oh, I think we prayed her out. I'm not sure. Uh, <clears throat> And then we called back at, at lunch. And, Has she moved in yet? Mm, no, she ain't got here yet. You know, I'm like, oh, we should have prayed she'd come because I know what happens if she don't pay her half. <laughs> you know, dad's going to pay that half. <laughs> but do you truly believe that God will do these requests that we give? No, oh, we don't. No, there's no way. There's absolutely no way. You cannot make me believe that. We do not believe because we do not pray. We do not pray. We'll do everything within our power, and then we'll stand and say, God, i got to have you come through. And God is up in heaven going, okay, I'm glad to watch you struggle. You've done it your way. Now I'm going to jump in, and I'm going to do it. Listen to this the pulling down of strongholds, the casting down of arguments. Every high thing exalts itself against the knowledge of God. And guys, I want, I want you to be careful of this, is that we can get so heavenly minded that we're no earthly good. We can get so, oh, I am such a mature Christian. Well, if you say that, you've indicted yourself at the moment. Now, somebody else says it. They've seen something in you. That's like somebody putting on the coat of, of humility. I am so humble. Doesn't work. Someone else has to put that on. What are the weapons of our warfare? Understand this. The, apart from the power of God, all of our energies combined have no avail over the power of darkness. Weapons mighty in God are the pulling down of strongholds, casting down arguments, every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. The word mighty means dynamic. There's dynamic power in us as believers. And if we believe that, we'd pray that way. God has supplied us with more than enough to get the victory. Understand this, the world is unprincipled. It's dog-eat-dog -dog out there. The world doesn't fight fair. They don't live or fight the battles that way and never will. The tools of our trade aren't for marketing and manipulation, but they are for demolishing the entire massive corrupting culture of today. Our tools are ready at the hand for the cleaning of the ground of every obstacle and building that lies in between us and maturity. What are the weapons of our warfare? They are three things. They're prayer, the word of God, and worship. 
And here's where I, I want to hang out for a moment. My fear is this, is that I'm, when I get to heaven and I look around and I see the mightiness of God, I'm going to, I, I'm, they're, in heaven, they're going to wipe away tears. Everybody says there's going to be no tears in heaven, but the Bible says he's going to wipe away the tears. And I think the reason he's going to wipe away the tears is because we're going we're gonna to miss it really bad. You say, Greg, you shouldn't say that. But I, I just really believe, I really believe that we don't live in that power down here and we're going to get up there and go, boy, I was good. I don't think so. I think we're going to go, man, I, I, can you just let me go back for one more day? Can you let me go back for a week? Can you let me? He's not. The weapons of a warfare is prayer. The greatest prayer in the Word of God is one that is, that is said at fever pitch before a football game. And I've been in a thousand of them. All right. Everybody gets together and you huddle up and somebody says, Our Father, and then it's like, boom, you go through that prayer. Have you ever just thought about that prayer? Have you ever thought about that prayer should be the prayer that you and I pray every morning when we wake up? The Lord's Prayer. <laughs> you would think that would be number one. The Lord's Prayer. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. So what do you get out of this prayer? First of all, that you are saying to the Father, first thing in the morning, Father, you are holy. You are consecrated. You are greatly revered. You are honored. I want your kingdom and not mine. And then we start with a part that says, give us. And then we go to forgive us. And then we go to lead us. And then we go to deliver us. And then we end with your kingdom, your power, your glory forever. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come, not mine. But I tell you what, it, it has stuck out to me, Chris, right here. It says this. It says, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. What's going on in heaven coming down to earth? God's will in heaven coming down to earth. I think everything would change. And then we say, Lord, give us three meals. I need to eat. And then God, forgive me of my sin, and I will forgive those who've sinned against me. And then God, lead me not into testing or temptation, but deliver me from the evil one. It's because it's your kingdom. It's because it's your power. It's because it's your glory forever and ever. Amen. Also says in Luke 11, 9 and 10, it says, For I say to you, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened unto you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks, the door will be opened. Ask, seek, and knock. We have not because we have not asked. Also, the Scripture says in Mark eleven twenty two through 25, how faith in God, Jesus answered, Truly I tell you, if anyone says to a mountain, Go, throw yourself into the sea, and does not doubt in their heart, but believes what they say will happen, it will be done for them. Therefore I will tell you, whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you may have received it, and it will be yours. And when you stand praying, if you hold nothing against anyone, or if you hold something against anyone, forgive them so that your Father in heaven will forgive you of your sins. Ask, believe, and receive. Now, this is where it gets messed up in our church. Some of us are not praying because we've prayed for so long and he's never answered that prayer the way we thought he should answer that prayer. 
But see, we missed the point. He answered the prayer. God always answers the prayer. He doesn't always answer it the way we do. And when we don't get the answer that we want, then we stop praying. Come on, church. You're just looking at me. I'm telling you. The reason we don't pray is because we've had our heart broken. The reason we don't pray is because when we prayed for healing for grandma, God healed her and took her to heaven. We want her to heal on earth. How dare you, God? And we're hurting and we're tore up over something that God answered. He just didn't answer it the way we wanted it answered. And when we look back at it, we're always mad. And and we're we're looking at God saying, man, I I hear you. I hear what they're saying, but I don't believe it because I can't see it. If ever the blinders come off of our eyes, we're going to be in shock. Because he is doing so many things, and we have no clue. We say, God's never done anything for me. Oh, yes, he has. You're still living. Every one of us in this room, if you had a normal teenage life, you've done something that you should have died over. You know you have. You should have died on the spot. I should be a headless student minister. And some of y'all think I am anyway. My buddy was riding that motorcycle, and I was on the back. We were going through the park, and he fell back on me, and I fell back. And if he had not fell back on me, you'd have never met me. Someone had put a string across a a line, and thank God he saw it. That's just one. I've got a thousand, and you do too. Church, hear me out. I believe with all my heart, if we start praying, we start seeing. If we're praying with the right spirit, we're praying with the right heart, if we would seek him and we would knock on heaven's door, if we would ask, if we would believe, we will receive. The second part of our weapons of warfare is the word of God. And I don't know about y'all, but I've got more. But I brought a few in here. I'm like most Christians. I got more Bibles than I can read. I got the anointed Bible right here. That's not Pentecostal. I've got the Holman Bible. Some people call that Southern Baptist Bible. I got Max Licato. Don't hold that against me either. I got the Jesus Bible. That really is close to God. And then I've got the English Standard Version. You say, you're confused. I might be. But my favorite is this, God's game plan. I got this at an FCA camp when I was working for FCA. You want to know what God wants you and me to do? It's time for us to get in his word. Listen to what is said about Zechariah and Elizabeth, the parents of John the Baptist. I want this said about me. Luke 1, 6 says, Both of them were righteous in the sight of God, observing all the Lord's commands and decrees blamelessly. Every bit of it. Righteous, blameless. Then the final weapon of our warfare is worship. Matthew 6, 9 through 13, and, and that was what was so cool is when I, I, I started studying this, the Lord's Prayer came up. It's worship. But not only Matthew 6, 9 through 13, it says John 4, 23 and 24, yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in the Spirit and in truth, for they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship in the spirit and truth. And, and, and here's what got me. As I read that scripture, it, it said this, and I know you heard it. It says, they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. The Father is seeking out worship. Try it on, folks. The Father is seeking out worship. 
And what I want to ask you this morning is this, as we prepare to leave this place, I want to give you a challenge. I want to ask you to sit down with God for about 15 minutes every morning with the weapons of your warfare, with prayer, with reading of the Word and worship. Now, there's enough stuff out there that you and I can find something that we like when it comes to all three categories. And when we think about uh, prayer, we just get on our face before Almighty God. Use the Lord's Prayer and then read the Word. And, and most of us are on some kind of app, and you can, there, there's thousands of them. And you can get one that will give you a verse every morning, and you can start with that. And then worship. You can go to YouTube, and you can, go, you can go from Bill Gaither all the way to the latest Christian praise and worship music, and you can have something piercing into your spirit every morning that you spend 15 minutes in prayer and reading and worship. And I promise you that if you do that and you come into this place, you won't struggle to worship. When you leave this place, you won't struggle to serve. Guys, I believe with all my heart, if we don't immerse ourselves in those three things that, that we call the weapons of our warfare, we're not going to be able to carry out the mission that is before us. But the Scripture says in Ephesians 6, verse 13 through 18, this is why you must take up the full armor of God so that you may be able to resist the devil in the evil day having prepared everything to take your stand. Stand therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having sod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace, above all, taking the shield of faith, with which you will be able to quench the fiery darts of the evil one and the wicked one, and take on the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, preparing always and praying always and supplication in the spirit and being watchful of this to the end with all perseverance and supplication for all the, for all the saints. Put on the full armor of God. I don't know if you realize this. I'm sure you have. Somebody smarter and already said it to you, I'm sure, but every piece of warfare armor that we are to put on is for the front. There's nothing for the back. If all the armor is for the front, then what should we do? We should stand and fight. We should move forward in battle. A man stayed in the jungle for 30 years killing cows, eating jungle fruit for one thing, his mission. And when you and I get disappointed, we get mad at some preacher, we get mad at a church, and we leave. I think we should be the ones who stand. Will you stand with me?